Hello, this is Fim Talk. Our Fim Talk guest today may have to prove one thing. Is the director more important than every other person on the film set when, they, when it comes to finishing the movie? Uh, really, because this guest has had to switch from being a cameraman and a director, directing actors and handling cameras. He understands the various artistic and technical filmmaking roles needed from story ideas to movies on screen. He was prepared through campus media studies in performing and filmmaking arts in the University of Calabar, Cross River State. There, as a technical director for campus stage production, he explored the use of multi-staging and multimedia in productions such as Waiting for Godot. That's a very uh, literary you know, uh, title. His experience include certified Ari cameraman, filmmaking consultancy, second unit directing, 2D and 3D, and VFX supervision. He applied those as a creative director at Stormblast Media in 2009, act director at Color Line in 2019-11, act director at N6, and here as a general manager We Entertainment Productions. In Nollywood, he has featured in Sisterly as a director, Just Before I Do as a director, Take Life as director of photography, Touch 2020 as director, Sanitation Day 2020 as director of photography, Mamba's Diamond, Director of Photography, Art Flat, Romantic Comedy. What did you feature as, uh, you know, what, 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 what were you doing on Romantic Comedy, on uh, Art uh, Flat? Art Flat, I was a cinematographer. Okay. Then, he won an award, the Ebony Live TV First Bank First Stars Prize. It was the first bank commercial advertisement award that he won. I can't remember the year. <laughs> Jake. <laughs> He, he's currently overseeing current uh, signature Wazubia programs and web projects. Web means we entertainment project or we entertainment productions. He is a disciple of innovative filmmaking technologies alongside photography and stop motion animations. And let me explain that he moved this program or this uh, video blog or, or uh, uh, podcast from my laptop to this studio. That means he engineered or catapulted me from laptop presentation to, <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 to studio presentation. So I will call him a generalist. So welcome, Generalist Solomon Esa. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so you, you understand the kernel of my argument. Everybody has been having this opinion that it is the director's film, and nobody else. And even on sets, they will say, the director coughs, keep quiet. If you cough, if you talk too much, you can send it off the set, you know. So what are your thoughts about the commonly perceived director's role as a superman on set? Yeah, so um, in my little journey in filmmaking, directing, and cinematography, I've been able to come up with a somewhat robust opinion about the role of uh, a director and um, how you know how important is it? And, but in my personal opinion, I've always felt um, I should be the dumbest in the room. If I'm a director, I should be the dumbest in the room. What I should do well is to bring together army of professionals, people who know how to turn an idea into finished work. And the very first thing to succeed at as a film director is if you're able to spot beautiful talent and manage those ta talents to bring the idea you have into finished product. Now you've just done probably 50% of your job as a director. And why I said that, in my opinion, the director should be the dumbest in the room because it just needs to get people to understand this vision. When they understand that vision, they would run with that vision. And um, unifying everybody's art artistic prowess and what they bring to the table, unifying that to say exactly one thing is, is, is one talent that I hardly see in a lot of directors that the names we are celebrating today is what they go by. So, um, you know, the idea of director being like a god in the sense of, it's, it's always been misconstrued. 
in the sense that um, it's not because of respect, it's not because of um, he comes into a room and everybody is bowing down and all that. It's just this is somebody who knows exactly what he wants. He's an architect who has envisioned his story and also has the knack to pick the right set of people to bring a certain vision to life. Now, a director without a vision who has looked at a script or has written something but does not have something to say would definitely not be able to lead a team to, to, to get a certain idea from paper to screen. So um, I've always laughed at people who want to portray themselves as they are kind of an idealistic god or whatever. Superman. Superman or rather I want to see the person who, you know, is looking for the best set of people out there in the industry and saying, okay, you know what, I want to bring you guys together. We need to we need to say something about this idea. We need to be able to, you know, convey this idea in a certain way where, you know, as soon as you see it, as soon as you experience it as a, as a, a viewer, you, you, you take that message home. So, I mean, that's how I've been saying it. Uh, anything other than that, uh, it becomes frivolous. Yeah, uh, so, so the second question would be, it would, stem, it would go like this. You think the script writer, the cinematographer, the director, and the editor. Somebody told me, look, if you staff, if you staff an editor of food, or drinks, you're in trouble. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, if you look at this array of talents or you know skills on a film set, can you connect the most important role that a director can play, or the most important role that a script writer can play, or the most important role an editor can play? I'm not even talking about the producer because it's the one of the idea. But these two, uh, three elements, or through cinematography, uh, script writing, uh, editing, and directing, seem to play very strong roles in realizing the films. Not even, even some talents can even edit your script and, you know, say something better yeah. when they are dialoguing. Yeah. So can you give us some insight into these nitty gritties of, uh, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because um, I've, I've taught a lot of film students and, uh, you know, there's always this funny thing that is always predictable where you have um, young people in film uh, come together to do a project and then there's always a lot of riff among them. And it's always about, you know, this, oh, who is supposed to, who has a better idea what. But I've always been trying to, you know, get them to understand something. Um, somebody should be able to champion an idea. Mm -hmm. And then it is the brilliance of the rest to say, okay, is this the idea you want to champion? Okay, this is how I can use my craft to elevate that idea. Now, when they say, um, for example, the example we were going for, if um, an editor is elevating a job, he doesn't elevate the job away from the original vision. Which is the director's vision. Which is the director's vision. So for example, a director might say, you know what, at the end of this film, I want people to walk away from this film feeling like, oh, this really touched me in a very melancholic way, right? And then, you know, because the the Materials have been put together. Mm. It's been shot. It's been, you know. So the editor knowing exactly that this is how we need to feel after watching a certain cut or a scene mm. would say, you know what? The way you said the director that you want this cut to come after this cut to come after this cut is not as melancholic as as you, as you wanted. Yeah. So I think if we put this cut and this cut together, and then we now do this. Now, we'll be able to achieve what you're looking out for, mm. right? And then that is where the brilliance of the other people who put, help put a film together are still going with the original um, vision. vision and saying, OK, this is how I can do it you know, two times better than what you were already mm. saying, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then you realize that it is not away from the vision. It is not, oh, there's a cooler way to edit it because it's been done in this movie. Let me edit it in that cool way. No, it's about serving a certain vision. And then is why I said you, you as a director should be the dumbest in the room because even though you feel, OK, this is how I should make it to look melancholic, these guys have been doing their jobs. The editors who have been editing for 20 years, um, the cinematographer has been doing his job for so, you know, they, the director would 
I hope you know the director will always have lesser jobs than these other mm -hmm. departments because these other departments have they've been doing so much that they've gathered they've amassed so much wealth of experience. understanding and experience that you know they can now help you channel your vision right so it's always about serving a certain vision a certain idea and you know raising it to a higher level based on the wealth of experience they've had quality collaboration but I would insist that the industry is not wrong in saying it is a director's film because the director has a vision, he's a team leader, and he leads them. He absorbs all the ideas he, he could ever absorb and then realize the vision. Of course, these other guys get credit. They don't, they, they, no, they they don't, they don't stop writing their names. So, yeah. so, so, yeah. so uh, yeah, we have sort of you know, uh, delved into you know, the collaborative teamwork or team spirit on set. Now, I'm going to go particularly concerning the cinematographer, and the director's interplay on a film set. So explain the collaboration between these two very active elements on set. So that's the first marriage um, every production should have. Mm. Um, um, in fact, it goes beyond just saying, oh, we have a project to work on. Mm. Let's do this project. It's all about, you know what, both of us are locked into this. There's going to be a lot going on over the amount of time that we're going to face this project, but we know that, you know, we figure out where we are going. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in the middle, but we know exactly where we are getting to. So with that in mind, um, how both of those characters interplay as they go on that journey of making a film is very, very important in the sense that, you know, there will always be things happening. Mm -hmm. There will always be budget cuts, there will always be uh, um, uh, a wrench thrown into the works. But they know exactly where they are going to at the end of the day, mm -hmm. and they stick to it, which is the discipline in filmmaking. And then, you know, they, because they are not um, antagonizing each other, they would find a way to get to that end. Now, which is why I'm saying that is the first marriage that has to work. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, every other thing falls apart. Um, now, like I said, um, the cinematographer is basically the painter, the director's painter, right? So he holds a brush. He holds a brush. Um, the, he, he knows exactly what the director is trying to do, or he explores exactly what the director wants, and then uses everything that has to do with visuals to paint that vision that the director is going for. And once that happens, once that marriage happens, which is why you see um, some filmmakers would always use the same cinematographer because it's not because they are like, uh, there's no, um, oh, he's my friend, I know him. That's all. No, because there is a sort of marriage that there's works a, there's very well. There's a level well. of skill, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that happens. So they, there's a lot of um, um, dialogue that is not even, taking place, but they understand what they are doing. So that make, once that job, once that collaboration is working, a lot of things just move. Now between the technical crew overseen by the cinematographer, can we see a situation where the director can go beyond or go behind the cinematographer and talk to the technical crew? It will be dangerous. It will be, it will be dangerous. And um, there's nothing like an isolated kind of talk. We, of course, a lot of things, the magic of film happens long before the first day of shooting. So um, a director that has done his homework would not even have anything to do with the rest of the crew. Mm. The person he would always have a lot of talk with on set will always be either the cinematographer or the, some other key people. Um, like the script writer? So the script writer depends on the kind of director. So. Um, you have a director who would take a script and say, okay, this is what I want to say with the script. You have other directors who would say, you know what, I really want to understand why you put this scene here. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a situation where I've been in situations where I really wanted the writer to be by my side. So i will be like, okay, so what were you thinking? I know what you're, you've written here. I know what you're going for. But I really want to understand why you did this. So if... By having that conversation with the writer, it gives me a better way of approaching a certain scene. There are some other projects I would say, you know what, I understand what you're saying, I know where I'm going to, I don't really need 
you on set. I don't need to have, I must have had a lot of discussions with the writer because you need to understand a lot of things the writer is doing because at the end of the day, you need to adopt the thing the text is saying. But one thing is to adopt what the text is saying. Another thing is to now say, this is what I want to say with this your text. But if you don't understand what the text is saying, how do you now have a vision, right? So it's always that disconnect that seems like that births a lot of this argument. But a smart director will always say, I really need to understand your text. If I understand your text, then I have a vision. I would have something to say. Because something to say is actually the storytelling. And then the so you have those two instances where you either want that person with you all the time, or you totally understand what's going on, and you say, OK, now that I understand this, I have to move in this direction with you. So with that, in those two scenarios, when it's done very well, you don't see a writer come to say, you know what, this is not what I was writing, mm -hmm. um, or I don't like what happened. You will see less of that. Of course, if you see great films, you've never seen writers who come to say, you know what, that was not what I said. You know, they will always say, you know what, I wrote it like this. And then the director said, you, you know what can be cooler if what you're saying, we elevate it to this point. You know, I was like, oh, I, I didn't even think of that. It was the director that thought of that. Or it was this person that thought of that. But at the end of the day, it's, like, it's understanding what the text was saying and not going against the text. Because we might say, I will give, a, I will give an example, because I, I think one of the cool things about one of the frustrating things about having film discussions is when there is no example, some people understand all the grammar they are speaking. So you have a film where the writer is saying, OK, this is the, this is the bad thing about rape, mm. right? Now, you, you ask a lot of questions. You read the text. You try to understand what the writer is saying. And the writer is saying, oh, rape is bad, and this is the repercussions of this. Right? Now you understand the text. Now, by understanding the text now, you can now say, OK, this is what I want to say with this text. Mm. So you decide that, OK, you know what? To show that rape is bad, let me show it from the point of view of the victim, for example. Now, that is you now taking a direction, but from understanding the text. As against where you have problems where somebody will be like, oh, why is he writing? Why, why did the writer write that this person comes outside, stands in the rain, and cries. So and probably doesn't even understand He doesn't why even they, understand why. Uh, and say, OK, fine, we don't need rain. Let's just shoot the person crying in the, in the, in the yeah. toilet. You okay. know? So probably the writer felt, oh, this rain shows the earth crying with the person. And, right? and probably exaggerated the yes. effects. So you want to really show that. And this is why a lot of things are so monotonous and so dry. Mm. But when you, don't, when you don't understand the text, you cannot elevate it. Now, you, all of a sudden, you understand that, oh, this rain is important in this scene. And you now say, OK, you know what? This is what I want to do with this rain. I want it to be, as soon as she steps out, there's thunder, and then there's rain, and the person is drenched, and whatever. But you've elevated the text mm -hmm. beyond what was know, written, but still following what the text is saying. But now you have a way you want to tell the story. To elevate the story. To elevate the story. To evoke emotions. Evoke emotions and all that. This sounds like we're actually on a film set anyway. So, <laughs> so, so but let me ask one you know, very diligent, very important question. Between the floor manager, I've had somebody who told me, look, when I'm, on, when I'm on the floor, I'm as good as a director. Because in the long run, I'm the one who manages the budget. That's the production manager. Now you have the producer, and the producer says, stands somewhere and says, look, we don't have money, we're cutting down on budget. And the PM says, look, what do we do? And the director says, this is what I want to shoot. Can you, can you, can you uh, cause, let us understand what kind of debate would actually you know, take place when these three skills come to a point where they have to debate and agree on how to move forward with a low budget or budget cut? I've always said that um, it is never the director or the production manager or the executive producer or cinematographer that is the boss mm -hmm. of the film. It is the idea itself that is the boss of everyone, right? Um, it just takes someone who has to take that decision and say, this is the direction I'm going. And then everybody falls in line, right? Including the director that came up with the idea. The worst thing that can happen to a director is to say, this is what I'm trying to do. And then all of a sudden, it derails or goes 
the different direction. Yeah. So he still has to obey what he has already set in motion in the beginning. So you have, um, you know, um, a production manager will say, you know what, we, we, our budget can't do this. The wrong kind of conversation will be, you know what, I'm the director, this has to happen. This is a very bad. But what the, the, the right conversation should be, okay, you don't have money for this scene. Can we, because this scene is the most pivotal scene in this movie, can we take money from somewhere else and, and put into this scene? Or probably strike the set and look, go look for money. Yes, and go look for money. I'll say, oh, you know what, um, because if, is, if the discussion has been had long before um, first day of um, principal photography, mm. all this would have been laid bare yeah. and it would have been solved. You, know? um, you can now say, you know what, I need this scene. Um, the extra this scene will cost, can we take it from this other scene? Because this other scene, instead of having them speak in the car, we don't rent the car again. Mm. I can have them speak in a room or stand somewhere, right? Because you, you understand that taking the car out of the scene doesn't affect the scene in any sure, way. Sure. So you now say, okay, can you take the budget from the car and put it into this? Now, that is the collaboration that is supposed to happen. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we are still serving the, the idea. Same purpose. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's very intelligent. That's very like what I want to hear. <laughs> so, so, so I'm still talking to Solomon Esang, director, cinematographer, and GM Web Productions. Now, let's come to the nitty gritty of actual shoot. <laughs> How does that cinema? I mean, you've been a cinematographer for some time, a director of photography for some time. You've directed, so you should be able to really, really explain your understanding of composition lighting, and camera techniques that impact emotional and thematic elements of a narrative. I mean, how do you hit on the theme, impact emotion, or evoke emotion with composition, lighting, and camera techniques? OK, so I want to believe that these questions have been asked in different ways. And I would rather vent my frustration and answer it in a certain way. If I'm, if I'm permitted, yeah. So this is my frustration about this. There is um, one of the most abused word in filmmaking, not only in Nigeria but everywhere, mm. including Hollywood right now. One of the most abused word is the word cinematic. Okay. So I'm now serving the question you're asking with a word that encompasses everything. Everything, yeah. So the word cinema or cinematic or has been so abused because of the advent of YouTube and digital camera, mm. right? So um, one of the first time we started getting spots was when we had uh, digital cameras that you can just point camera and shoot. But because we had these two things happening, we had um, we moved away from cinema cameras to digital cameras. A lot of discipline that we we used to imbibe when we we're making a film mm. was dropped. On the celluloid. Yeah. So. You now have people who say, you know what, I need to emulate celluloid. Mm -hmm. How do I use a, cinema, um, a digital camera to emulate celluloid? So they started saying, OK, you know, you put black bars at the top, at the bottom, you do this, you do this, you put film grain, whatever. It, is, it, it looks cinematic. <laughs> so they always end it with that, it looks cinematic. cinematic. If you do this, do this, do this. If you change the settings this way, if you do this, the image will now be cinematic. So but, so, so, but let me understand how an image becomes cinematic. Is it when it is clean? Is it when it is, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not a cinematic, so I don't, I don't yes. understand. So which is exactly my gripe, <laughs> right? So um, because that has been you know, proliferated for a long time, people are now pursuing cinematic in a very different direction. Mm. Now you have, um, OK. Um, you, it's best I approach it this way. What makes a piece of film cinematic? That's the question. It is never about the camera work mm. alone, for example. It is never about, oh, the, the, the biggest camera in the industry. It's not about the amount of sharpness or um, the lenses you're using. But it's a combination of a lot of things that comes to make something an experience. Mm. Like I've been saying, there's no need calling film cinema if it is not experiential. Uh, and let me cut in there. And you hear people like, I'm shooting film for the cinema. Mm. 
or I'm treating things for online distribution. Perhaps if you strike a difference between the two, we can actually let the layman like me understand, mm. you know, get a clip. Because when people in Hollywood say, I'm, I write a script because I want to shoot it for the cinema. <laughs> I know what I'm <laughs> so you're raising it too high, so it will be too cinematic. I can't, I can't afford the budget. So it's where, it's where people get away with taking a lot of money and throwing it into the film because they want it to be for cinema, right? Meanwhile, the amount of work that goes into making something cinema-worthy is left alone, right? So the first thing they will always want to do is to get an ARRI because that's the industry standard. Mm. But the problem is that image what is alone... What is an ARRI? Is it, is it oh. the general as a bullet? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, ARRI is the industry standard camera okay. when you're doing uh, cinema. Made by who? Because of um, ARRI. ARRI is a company yes. that... Yes, uh, I think there were two brothers who came together to... I can't remember. Let me... Nobody should quote me on that. Okay, but what's the technical, definitive components of an ARRI camera? Oh, so I think I should just say two things. The highlight roll off and the way it handles skin tone. Okay. Right? So um, we've gotten to the point where a lot of other cameras are now simulating that or getting close to that. Um, the, when we moved to digital cameras, um, the ARRI was the only camera that can simulate its cousin, which was ARRI started with um, celluloid, right? Okay. So when they moved to cinema, they wanted to be as close as possible to celluloid, right? So you would see um, grain, you would see the way it behaves, you see the way it handles highlights, and the, you see the way it handles skin tones, right? So um, that amount of technology was so high up there that even um, Ari has done only four versions of their cameras with the same sensor, mm. right? They only changed their sensors their sensor a few years ago, I guess. So they, they, have, they have the ARRI 35 and the LF because they wanted to. Now there's a growing industry standard in the way we are presenting, mm. right? So they wanted to. But besides that, nothing is even wrong with the first first generation ARRI cinema um, digital camera, which is the Alexa XT. So the the best thing that's ever happened. Where and then not only that, the build quality. Um, when I went for the ARRI training, um, they, they showed us one camera that they wanted to sell, that ARRI in Germany wanted to sell. The camera was burnt. It, they used it for a, an action film. The camera was burnt. A lot, part of the body was damaged, was really beat up. And the man said, this camera still works. Mm. And if I show you images from this camera, you would not know that it's this beat up camera. So this is where um, high-level cinematographers don't want to end up maybe in the Alps, in the mountains, mm. and then all of a sudden, the camera is not working. How do you travel back to go get another camera? Meanwhile, if you, the, all the proliferated cameras these days, they can get to, like sometimes I can be in my hotel room, just the AC alone, and my camera stops working. But you know that Ari will work in the mountains where there's snow, and it will work where the, you're shooting volcano. Right? It is that robust, versatile, and very hard. And so as a very ambitious layman, <laughs> who probably is blind <laughs> to all the facts that I need to do, or what I need to do to make a movie cinematic, how would the Ari help such an irrelevant ambition man? <laughs> the, simple, the simple answer to that, it doesn't help you. Oh, so it, that's, is your, it is your technique now that helps you. Yes, so that's my gripe. So it is never about, because what you've noticed now, in, especially in, in the Nigerian film industry, is that we have good images. You cannot, there's nothing they are shooting in Hollywood in terms of image quality that we are not replicating. We are doing that. Mm. We're using the same kind of cameras, right? It may be, maybe the setup might be different, but then image quality wise, we are there. But still, you ask yourself, why is it not, why don't I feel like it's as cinematic as... Uh, my feelings are we're not telling the story. No, so I would answer it this way. Um, it goes back to exactly what I was saying about if you have an idea, how do you make this idea resonate, mm -hmm. right? It is the combination of a lot of elements, from the camera work yeah. to the sound to the... 
that makes something cinematic as against a good image or as against if the sound doesn't work well with the audio uh, with the video if the pacing if the tone all those things that we're supposed to be learning as directors the tone the pacing the the way the camera is moving or not moving how the actor reacts to a certain element or whatever all this coming together makes something cinematic rather than a good camera or the web, whatever we are coming up with so that was why I said, you know, because we were trying to get our cameras to look cinematic, we mm. forgot what cinema is all, about. is all about. Like, I've always said, your film is supposed to be an experience. You don't, you, people don't pay to watch a film. People pay to have an experience. And the closest thing to an experience that people have, that is very popular, that people are, that we've experienced in the past few years is the culminating um, edition of um, um, the End Games, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where all the storytelling over the years finally got to a point where people now had to sit together to experience the last. And then when they saw some scenes that really brought in the catharsis, they had that experience. So it became an experience. And it wasn't because the you know, it was maybe the camera work or is the storytelling and all the um, elements that came in to boost the storytelling, right? The sound, the way a certain line was said. You know, we, sp we spent how many years waiting for the Marvel characters to say Avengers Assemble. We never got to see that until we now finally saw that in the very last, you know, so that is an experience. So a brilliant filmmaker should be able to take all the elements of filmmaking to make the piece of film an experience. Now, that is what they call cinematic. I, I watched a movie. I was in a theater recently. I watched a movie. And as, when they were advertising the technical backbone of uh, what kind of films feature in the theater, and we were about to start watching the Nigerian movie, and this announcement came. Sorry, all that we've talked about, about 3D, 2D, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry you wouldn't experience it in this film. <laughs> I was like, so, <laughs> so what is this now? So let's talk about the 2D and 3D experience, or 2D, 3D cinematic experience. Mm. Does, that, does those two, do those two matter, matter in any way? Yeah, so like I said, um, let, me, let me take us a little bit back. Mm. So we've been shooting, or filmmakers have been shooting films in a certain way until um, Spielberg felt, you know, if I want to shoot um, a character that is larger than life, which is a dinosaur, how mm. do I make it very experiential? Mm. So he decided to choose a certain aspect ratio that is, that is normally not used in filmmaking. So a lot of the image was this tall rather than being this wide because they, he wanted to compare the size of human being to the dinosaur. And the first time you go to a cinema to experience it, you can take in the vastness and the largeness of the dinosaur. So it's the understanding of how you use technology to tell a story, to create an experience that can now make you say, okay, this is the technology I want to use. That brings us to 3D. Now, if you feel like this story works very well, if I'm using 3D technology, then by all means go for it. And it is, it's also about the knowledge. It's not because you are a Hollywood director and you have access to 3D um, mechanisms. And whatever. Oh, let me put, you now make a romantic comedy in 3D. <laughs> it makes no sense. So it, it was one of the reasons. Unless you want to see King Kong loving him. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so it was one of the reasons why um, 3D, I believe 3D died quick in Hollywood because it wasn't now used because of what it can do to create an experience. It was just a cash-grabbing avenue. So mm -hmm. every other film was in 3D. So um, what is the D that is working now? So the, the 3D, you mean as it's working in the... The, the D that is working, really working now? No, right? nothing. Everybody has gone back to it. If you know, there's no movie in 3D so really? far. The yeah. highest we do is you remaster something in 3D. And it's always anything that has to do with... For example, maybe the Pokemon movie, they want to, because you still have that infrastructure. You mm -hmm. still need to make money. For example, let's say IMAX had a, 
it, yeah, it, it was IMAX that said, I'm sorry, this movie yes. was <laughs> Now, so you have uh, IMAX now. They've paid millions and millions of dollars to create that kind of cin um, um, uh, cinema, right? Mm -hmm. And our Nigerian filmmakers don't understand 3D technology, or they don't have the wherewithal, whether financially or technically, to or willingly, make a film. Or willingness. Yeah, or willingness, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, even if we have, which film can we say in the last five years that we've made in, in, Hollywood, in Hollywood in the last five years that can be remastered for 3D to be experienced as 3D? I guess that's why that's they, a question. I, I guess that's what I must apologize and say. I'm yes, sorry. because you know um, they must have mastered a King Kong movie, mm -hmm. right? And that will work very well in um, in a 3D um, environment. But you know, once you move from that to a Hollywood film, what are you going to a Hollywood film? What are you going to do in 3D? Are you going? Is it a guy that is about to slap the other guy? That is supposed to be in 3D. It doesn't make any sense, and then it doesn't make financial sense mm. to the companies because if it was doing very well for um, the people who have IMAX here, if it was doing well financially, you would have had six more, mm. maybe across the country, maybe in Abuja, or whatever. So it is also that um, um, economics of it all, you know. Um, the Hollywood bamboozled everybody. They got tired of it, we moved on. Let me ask, for the sake of the layman, you know, can you de 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 define the dimensions? 1D, 2D, 3D, or whatever D. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we experience life in 3D. Mm. But when we now see life on a flat screen, that's two-dimensional. Okay. So on a flat screen, the two-dimensional, you can, you can still see, OK, this is somebody standing far away from, well, for example, your eyes would see that we are standing a little bit away from the screen behind us. But we are seeing it on a flat surface. Okay. So it's been shown in 2D, okay. right? Now, for it to now show in 3D is the way we actually see things in real life, where we know that this is how far you are. My brain can calculate the distance between me and you, and then and you to the wall next to you, right? So the separation, which is the 3D now, your brain starts seeing that. And, and that was where medically we're having issues, because our, our eyes and our brain is used to a 3D environment. Now we now did a 3D environment in a 3D environment. So our brain was like, OK, what's going on? And that's why you, you, when you leave a theater, after watching 3D, you have headaches. Because that's your eyes and your brain trying to comprehend this new thing that is happening. So, um, so you have that 2D, which is the one that we are used to. Our brain as, you know, growing up as a child till we are adults, we are used to a 2D plane seeing anything that is 3D, mm -hmm. right? Then we are now seeing 3D in 3D. We have uh, people who are now complaining, oh, I'm having a headache after watching whatever. So you have that 3D. There's only like 4D, but 4D in the sense that after seeing image in three dimension, the fourth dimension is experiential in the sense that if you go to IMAX now, if um, something explodes, you see puff of air hit you at the cinema. And then um, they also put um, infusers or something that gives smell. Mm -hmm. So if somebody throws something, you're supposed to experience the smell. And so that's the fourth dimension of um, film viewing. Or so film let me experience. quickly say, what's this? virtual imaging that we plug on uh, gadgets on our eyes and begin to experience as if it is happening. Can you explain that? Oh, so yeah, you have the, um, the goggles or glasses mm. that separates the images based on um, the color. Mm. And I've um, um, forgotten the other words. It's called stereoscopic. Stereoscopic is um, um, the technology where you have but two um, eyes seeing things in different um, spaces. Mm -hmm. So you have this other eye showing you something on this level, okay. and then you have the other um, lens showing you something that is Maybe away. farther off, yes. So but by the time your eyes take those two together, you see those two, which now shows you in things one, that are far and okay. things that are so that's the, the depth of experience. vision uh, in, the, in the foreground, the background. And then the, you can see that it's really separated, because one lens is giving us the back, 
The other lens is giving us the one that is close to us. And then already, our eyes and our brains are used to seeing things in 3D. Mm. Now you now have 3D in 3D, which was the problem we now had. Now, you mentioned the issue of using 3D to, you know, uh, elevate images. Now, let's look at composing shots. Now, if you're directing the cinematographer, how do you select, what's the process of selecting shots? Apart from, I understand it's about, you know, really conveying what the scriptwriter, scriptwriter wrote, but then, how do you communicate this process to, you know, to and fro? What do you think, what the cinematographer has to do, what the actor has to say or act? So you have, um, I think the first thing they will always do is, is this film good enough for 3D? No, is this film meant to be experienced in 3D? So that's the first question that has to be gotten out of it. For example, if it is like, okay, you're watching a transform. I, I'm sorry I cannot use any of our films. As an example, I mm. only use the ones that. So, for example, Transformers, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of explosions. There's going to be things transforming and becoming very large. There's going to be things flying towards you and all that. Now, with that sense, now you know that okay, this Transformers movie, I'm going to do it in. I'm going to shoot it in the sense that it can be remastered for 3D, right? So you can either shoot to remaster or actually shoot it in 3D. How do you shoot it in 3D? You use a stereoscopic lens or a camera that deals with two images. So it takes in the ones, one side of the camera will record anything that is farther away. The other lens will record, will record anything that is close. So, and it marries that in the um, processor and then it is later edited. Or you remaster it. How you remaster it is when you finish shooting in, 3D, in 2D. You take it to a sort of computer that now separates it and gives it space. Right? It's what um, people in, who use um, Adobe Photoshop, for example, so they work in layers and now make the, um, not Adobe Photoshop, um, the other one from Adobe, where they now separate things Adobe in layers. Adobe Premiere? No, Adobe um, After Effects. Okay. So where you put things in 3D and start set, pushing it further and backwards, right? So you have, everything now works in the Z plane rather than the X and Y plane. So you know, X and Y plane is up and down, um, but then the Z plane is now further or backward. So they now start separating everything. What should be in front, what should be at the back. So if, if I'm trying to punch you, it's not my face that should be in front. So they will separate the hand and make sure the hand comes closer to you, and then my face maybe goes out of focus or goes back. So when you see this happening, you, you feel like the hand's coming close to you. I think one of the best use of 3D is not even in film, it's actually in billboard advertising. Mm. And if you, if, if you go to, um, if you look at the streets of um, Tokyo, Japan, they do a lot of 3D advertising where somebody can pull um, a hand is giving you a drink and you think the drink is coming straight at you. So it's a better way of using the 3D technology than for us to be experiencing it in cinema. Does this advert when you're coming, when you're going from Lekki to Bia or the, uh, at the Koyi Bridge here, very close by, you see a gorilla walking oh. along a, a, a Lagos street and mm. you, you actually think this is a gorilla walking on the street. Yeah. Does that have to do with what you're saying? Yeah, it's still the same technology, but it's just some are more advanced than the other. Okay. Now, we, we've said so much about, you know, but um, if you were, for example, to, Let's say you're shooting a propaganda movie and you want to deliberately, deliberately use short duration choices and pacing to see uh, a helpless child running before a maniac soldier who wants to kill for the joy of killing. How would you, how would duration choice, uh, choice, uh, duration of, oh, sorry, duration of uh, shots that you use and pacing create specific moods or atmospheres to impact your audience. Okay, so yeah, so like um, I've said this before, where there's a lot of things that come together. For example, you've said a child who is running away from a manic um, soldier wants to kill. Now, um, the very first basic and without thought um, idea is to oh, shoot it in slow, right? Mm. Uh, this is where we always get it wrong. 
So you end up shooting in slow motion, but you still don't feel the impact of it, which is comes back to the idea of... Now, let me jump in there. Do you yeah. shoot in slow motion or effect slow motion during processing? Mm, so what I... Oh, in processing. Okay. Uh, if, if, your, if the idea is to shoot in slow motion, you shoot in camera um, high speed. Okay. Because by the time you now put it in playback mode, it becomes slow motion. Oh. Now, it's the amount of the slow motion that will now determine how high speed it is. So there's, there's That's a little... That's very interesting. But I've never heard that. I thought, I used to think you shoot conventional or normal or usual and go and it, it affects yeah, slow motion. So you motion. have a lot of problems when you start doing that. So uh, uh, it's, it's always about knowing exactly what to do and how to apply the technology. So the, the, there's a lot of math. That's, there's a little bit of math that goes in. So if you want it to be this slow, then you increase the speed to this when you're shooting. Or if you want it to be nearly regular, you, there's a certain amount of speed you shoot. So by the time you bring it into your non-linear editing, the amount of speed you want. So it still begs the question of what are you putting together to make it cinematic? And cinematic means how do we want to portray this scene or this shot in such a way that Somebody who is watching will feel that, oh, this child is in peril of a manic soldier. So, like I said, it would be very, very um, basic of me to say I'm shooting slow motion. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, That's meanwhile, the that comes out yeah, so because, mind. yeah, <laughs> if I was to use, <laughs> if I, <laughs> it's so basic and it, because it, we're used to it, right? Mm -hmm. But you did not listen to your idea first. That's interesting. Listen and you to did, your idea. yeah, you did not listen to your idea first because you said this is how I want to portray this. Or story. see your idea. Yes. Before you, quickly, you first. Yes, you quickly abandoned your story because you quickly abandoned the idea because you've seen a cool slow motion Somewhere. in something else that maybe looked closely to what you're doing. So immediately, this is where the argument of oh, there's a cooler way of doing it. Let's do slow motion. But when you do slow motion, it may not be as impactful as you trying to employ. Um, employ all the elements of what makes something cinematic. But when you do this, and then you have the discussion and say, OK, this is what I'm trying to portray with this child doing this. Maybe it's shock value you're looking for. Slow motion will never give you shock value, right? So um, that is the, that is the uh, conversation you start having with yourself and with the rest of your crew to say, you know what, we're not going to shoot slow motion for this one. We will just see a child running. And all of a sudden, we see a bullet rip through the child. And by the next shot, we now see that there's a soldier, right? And the shock value of that may be what you were trying to go for, right? It may be slow motion. But then how do you now do the slow motion? Are we adding music? Are we adding, are we, are we adding elements in the visuals to really make it so for example, a child running in the field and running in an open plane and a manic soldier is running after the child seems good enough. But you can elevate it because you understand what you want to do by saying, oh, it's very muddy, it's raining, the child is barely making strides, and you know, this man is bigger, he's catching up slowly, um, he's catching up by every step, you know. So creating that atmosphere that this is how difficult it is, you know. You may be drawing from the inspiration of, oh, when you're in your dream and you're trying to run away from something, you feel you can't run as fast as you can. Now, this is where the idea of slow motion and making you feel like you cannot run fast can be employed. So you make the whole place muddy, you make rainfall, you, you now make the child really try to run. Meanwhile, the man is gaining up. All this with maybe sound, sound effects, music, whatever, would come together to make it cinematic. And cinematic in this sense is you make the audience say, oh, there's no hope for this child. And then you want to, you're eager to see the child, you know, make it, and you're afraid for the child. And this is the whole thing we're trying to go for at the end of the day, not just slow motion. I, I also imagine that the child had, had, would have actually escaped and felt I've escaped him. Then all of a sudden from nowhere, bullet, it's the child. And we got the soldier smiling mm -hmm. and feeling satisfied. Mm -hmm. That passes a very big message. I can even elevate it to more, uh, where you have, um, which is what we don't do. Mm. If you know that you're going to have that encounter happen, 
you need to make us know the child. Yeah. Right? So what do you do previously before this happened? Backstory. So either the backstory or the introduction of a child. This, this is the life of the village. Mm -hmm. This child runs into every home in the village and everybody is happy to see the child. And what. Just creating that thing in the hearts of and in the mind of the viewers is potent, is so potent that by, by the time you place the child in that scenario, that is all the cinematic you're looking for. And perhaps the child could have been a David who killed Goliath and is finally killed by a second David. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, but it's, it's always about understanding. And then, yeah. it's always about understanding, you know, when you understand all these tools at mm. your fingertips, mm. you can do anything. I, I, I'm worried when you go, when producers in Hollywood say, there's something like, I want you to write the script like, you know, that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's the value of imputation? Because you talk about, you talk about somebody saying, probably seeing a movie, so I, was it, I, I want to do it here. So what's the value of imitation or emulation? Is it worthwhile in a movie? So, uh, um, so... You see somebody doing that, and then they, they use the phrase, another abuse phrase, um, um, imitation is, you know, there's always that phrase they use to explain away the fact that they are copying something. Mm. And instead of referencing, mm. we copy. Um, so um, it's, it's one of the most dangerous part of why a lot of things we do, not every film in Nollywood, but the majority of our film is so monotonous because we are just picking off of maybe a, sus a financially successful Movie. predeceding film. Yeah. And we say, okay, you know, we need to do exactly this. Like that. You know, there was a time the word, I can use it now because everybody knows about it. There was a time everybody wanted to do another wedding party. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but they forgot the core of what made wedding parties successful. Success. So without that knowledge, you would only want to be throwing party and pointing cameras at party <laughs> and a, a woman yelling. Yeah, so. <laughs> so interesting. Now, I mean, at, at, what at any point in time would you have had the experience of a, a technical uh, input, uh, overwhelming artistic input to, you know, put out a story in a very good way? Oof. Where do I start? Um, you know, there's always... Film in its own, film on itself, putting it together, bringing a lot of people together to, to point cameras at something is already too hard on its own. But then you now have, okay, I want to do something. You understand what you're trying to do, but then you now have either financial constraints, which is the least, mm. but the biggest is um, mindset constraints, right? So... The mindset is always one of the biggest problems. Mm -hmm. you, you are with a bunch of people who don't really understand what it means to make something an experience. A lot of them are here for the paycheck. A lot of them are here because they've had a lot of films under their belt. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are forced or forced into your you know, group and you, know, you just have to make do what you have. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things. I'm, I've always been saying that money is the least because you can make short films and it's Short films might be with just um, money for everybody to eat, a few um, petrol money, and that's it. But it's always a mindset thing. Um, I believe that um, if you want Nollywood to really take a very huge trajectory to the right direction, it's not even to look at um, and emulate Hollywood. Um, you have other countries who they are really about the craft. And you have directors who are really, really understanding that, okay, this is what we're doing as craft, and they are learning in that direction. Rather than, oh, as a director, if I put a bunch of inf uh, Instagram influencers, I'm going to make a good film, right? So we, over the years, are not you know, really studying what makes film an experience and then bet, um, making our craft better as we make the next film. So with that, with that being non-present, we have a mindset issue that needs to be fixed. Then we can now approach film the way it's supposed to be. Film will always be. So there's this um, misconception that times are changing. Times are changing, but film in its purest sense has never changed. So. 
we still need to learn that um, equipment to change. Um, there were techniques that um, um, old Hollywood had to break, use half of, build the whole set just because they wanted the camera to travel. And they had to build the whole set just to, to aid a camera traveling in a certain way. But we now have technology that doesn't afford you to, you don't need to break, uh, build the whole set because of the way the camera can now travel. So technology is changing, but the idea behind what you're trying to show or portray doesn't change. The, the purest and core part of what makes film film does not change. Equipment might change. So understanding is, is the equipment that a lot of us are learning, but not what makes film film. In other words, we lack a management industry, so to say. Yes, you know, so I'm still talking to Solomon Sang, director, cinematographer, and GM Web Productions. I'm going to have to roll a lot of questions into one or two. Um, um, yeah, have you had a situation where, as a director, who is collecting the technical and artistic ingredients in the filmmaking, had, had to clash with the cinematographer, whom you call your painter or your paintbrush? but is inclined to believe that his technical input is far better than your artistic interpretation. Would you, have you ever had any sort of, that sort of clash? Oh, I've been in situations where it was the other way around. You have, um, so the reason I have problems with directors, and even others that are seeing it don't understand where my problem is coming from, is we have um, the initial discussion and I'm trying to understand what you're trying to do with your film. Mm. You know, so some of them can't answer that question because they don't know. They just believe that we just, this is the script, put a bunch of people together and, and you know, start, shooting. start shooting. So I'm like, I'll start asking core questions that are supposed to make me, as a cinematographer, serve your vision. But you realize that you're having preliminary discussions with the director and mm. there's no vision. All he's saying is how much do you want to collect? Uh, we are shooting on the 14th, things like that. So with that not happening, so I would end up either pulling out or they would say, oh, you know, we know that you can do this. So they would say all sorts of things, just keep me on the project. Um, and then on the other hand, if I'm, a, if I'm a director, I'm always very skeptical about the cinematographer I'm working with. Do you, how much do you understand your craft? So one thing is understanding your craft the other is how much you understand my vision and how much of the bank of wealth do you have to um, take my vision and run with it, right? So when you have this missing in a cinematographer, it gives a lot of problem to someone like me who you know, would say, okay, I understand what I'm trying to do and I understand the vision I'm trying to do, but I need someone who's going to you know, stay with me while we do this. People like, even a gaffer should understand the vision. Because if a gaffer understands the vision, they would know the choices of equipment they are bringing on set. So the point is, how do you resolve all this kind of clash? Because, I mean, if you say a gaffer should understand and a gaffer doesn't, if you say an artist or an actor should understand, mm. and they don't, mm. so how do does the Dalit stamp his authority, you know, with the hindsight that, look, there was a budget, or there's a budget, there's a job to be done, and there's an audience to satisfy? So, it, well, um, there are some things that is very hard to resolve where you have a mindset shift. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe in, a, in an army of 100 cinematographers, you can only work with five. Mm. And these five are not available. So, you, and then you don't even know, you only know one out of these five. Because I know there are brilliant minds out there. But because, you know, the, I, 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 I don't know if it is the industry that doesn't elevate these brilliant minds. Mm. So if they don't elevate them, I don't know where they are for me to say I want to work with them. I only work with people that they've been, they've had a lot of films under their belt. It's the people the industry know and all that. And um, it's the other way too. But I don't, if that is a question, I've been answering a lot of questions, but that's one question that is very hard for me to answer because we are now in the realm of needle in a haystack kind of thing. And perhaps we should ever pray that there shouldn't be any clash on any set. Yeah, or um, hopefully you find your, 
you find your yin to your yang, and then you stay with that person all through your career. Like you said before, you will have to know a guy who shot the last film that has with you. Mm -hmm. To you know, have, uh, strike a sort of nuance, personal nuance that will understand, make you understand. And nuances you know. are very, very important. That. Mm. But yeah, you the, like you said, technology is advancing, but the craft is declining. Yeah. Um, between the craft and technology, you stress the fact that the craft is very important. But then I know that I mean, you you are interested in in innovations. You know, how do innovations help craftsmanship? If I must say, if I must ask. Yeah. Oh, um, just like I gave that example where um, if I was to do a certain kind of shot, mm. right, I would have to build a whole set, which we don't have money for that. But all of a sudden, there is a steady cam that n not only works on the Y and Z, Y and X axis, it's also doing Z. It can, it's light enough for you to travel with it. You can only break sections of the. But then again, it's just what I want to say with the camera movement that is making me say, oh, you know what, this technology can serve this purpose, right? As against, I've seen um, the Ari Trinity, one, one set, I need the Ari Trinity. No, right? I would rather say, how do I want to portray this look? How do I want to show this? How do I want to, oh, there's a, there's a technology that can afford me to do this. Um, maybe um, before, we used to pull focus, right? But I know that in this setting shot, I have to pinpoint two focus, but I cannot do it while whatever is happening is happening. But then again, there's a technology that you can attach to your lens, and you've already pre-marked the two focus points at this right time you want it to happen, and then you pre-program it, and then you step away, and maybe it's an explosion, and allow the explosion to happen, and at the same time, that technology can take the two point of focus at the right time. Now you have technology that can afford you to now um, boost your experiential, right? So I'm always on the lookout for new technologies, mm. but I don't look at them to say, you know what, I want to use this technology. Because it simply will solve your pro problems yeah. or make you a lazy man like AI. Uh -huh. But <laughs> what, the, the only thing I think is, oh, with this technology, I can do this. Mm. Oh, with this technology, I can, I can make my language, I can now um, have a more sophisticated language, mm. right? Because sometimes when we are writing or coming up with ideas or scenarios, it's because we don't have the, the mouth to speak a certain language. Mm. We decide not to speak that language because we don't have the mouth. Now we have technology that, oh, this technology can do this for you. Oh, that means I can say this. Or that means I can present this idea this way. And that's why we need to keep embracing new technology. But we don't allow this new technology to rule us. Which brings me to the next question. I mean, in terms of craftsmanship, upgrading, learning, skilling up, you know, at the barest minimum when somebody probably, you know, becomes an apprentice, um, how do you go about improving skills of craftsmanship? Is it, do you, would you recommend on the job learning or going to film school? Whatever. Well, I believe it's what works for you. Like, I keep telling people that I never went to film school. But I wish I, I went to film school. Not because of what I would learn, mm. but because of the fact that you are going to meet like minds. I think um, I've been able to see a lot of people who, where they've asked them these questions, including very notable names. And the ones that never went to film school say, you know what, if I had gone to film school, it would have helped me in this way because I will meet a cinematographer that is thinking the way I'm thinking. So we, our career can just move. On. You have Matt Damon and um, Ben Affleck, who, you know, from the very moment they met, they're like, okay, this is my kindred spirit. This is the person I'll be doing a lot of projects with. And to the point where they, had a comp they have a company, and the company is doing very well. Uh, ben Affleck can go and do Batman, while this guy is doing Born Ultimatum, but they are always coming back to the office to say, you know what, this is a project we need to work on. The synergy is so good, but it, it was birthed when they were in the place where people of like minds can be, and such a place is the film school. Um, with the proliferation of YouTube and whatever, you can learn anything, right? So, but I believe that what makes 
film school important is that it's a way where we bring everybody that does what you do to the same place. Um, I never went to film school. Um, my amount of wealth is about is from the amount of knowledge I've been able to ingest over the years mm -hmm. and uh, practice. So the practice is now when you are in a film set, whether you're assisting, whether you're oh you know the friends on the film set, you went you go there, you carry wire, but you see the way they are behaving, you see the way things are happening. You also listen to people's interviews. You gather knowledge from everywhere. So it's one thing I would, not, I would, if I would be disingenuous to say film school is not important. But I am saying that from my experience, there's nothing film school could have taught me because I was ready at that level. So I didn't really need film school. It's not like film school was even expensive. So I was like, OK, so <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. I will learn on my own. Okay. So, yeah, uh, we're about to finish the interview. Uh, I've been talking to Solomon Isang, director, cinematographer, and GM Web Productions. And now, if you want to, like, summarize everything from bottom to top, or top, or what do you say, bottom to top, or top, bottom to top, 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 what, uh, what elegant advice would you want to give an average filmmaker, whether as a cinematographer or a director? Hmm. I think anybody watching this from the beginning knows exactly what I want to say. And that is, you need to take time. You need to take all the time in the world to learn what it means to be cinematic and to make film an experience, not just eye candy, but to make film an experience. Because if we go back to the, if we go back to the religion of making film an experience, the sky is the limit for us. The sky is the limit. Thank you, Mr. Solomon, for coming on this live This you is much. this has been very. I've, I never really knew anything about cinematography, though I've read a lot about light and shade and sound and da 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 that can evoke emotions from the audience. But this has opened my mind to the technical side. You know, marrying, like you said, there's a marriage between the cinema, cinematographer and the director. Thank you so much for being on Film Talk. That has been Film Talk. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram and at web.ng.